this is a passage full of practical instructions for believers. He is addressing Christians from different demographics, different walks of life. It's really just simple, straightforward teaching about the kind of character and attitudes and behaviors that should characterize the Christian. He addresses several different categories, different types of Christian character, things like being dignified, reverent, sensible, pure, above reproach. There are some more uh, deeper relational kind of heart issues like love and perseverance, kindness, self-control, being trustworthy. There's some very specific just rubber meets the road kind of issues like gossip and addiction to alcohol and stealing and our speech. But the point of the message this morning really isn't to look at the details of those commands, but to ask why. Why those commands? Why should Christians be characterized by these things? Because in this passage, there's a, there's a marvelous, neat, little, simple illustration, but it's an illustration about one of the big themes of all of Scripture, one of the big themes of the Christian life, and it has, it has really caught my attention recently. And so we're going to look at that illustration this morning. Let's pray before we dive in. Father, we need you this morning. I need you this morning. We need your word. We need your spirit to take your word and open our eyes to it and apply it to our hearts because we need to change, and your word is what changes us. So we're completely dependent on you this morning. So would you use a weak servant to magnify your greatness, and would you see fit to to build up and encourage your people this morning? We thank you in Christ's matchless name. Amen. Okay, so why? Why should Christians be characterized by these types of things? Now, obviously, there's, there are different true ways to answer that question. The Bible would have multiple answers for us. But right in this passage, Paul gives us the motivation. He gives us the reason for why these things should be important to us why our character and attitude and behavior matters. If you want to know the reasons why, we need to look at the so that's. Several times in this passage he says, do this so that this will happen. Here's the reason, here's the goal, here's the purpose. So let's look at the so that's this morning. First of all, in verse 5, I'm in 1 Timothy, there's Titus. It's windy up here. In verse 5, the end of the verse, so that, do these things, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. And then look at verse 8, in the middle of the verse, so that the opponent will be put to shame, having nothing bad to say about us. And then in verse 10, so that they will adorn the doctrine of God. We're going to look at those three so that's. We're going to look at the first two kind of quickly and then really park on that third one so that we will adorn the doctrine of God. Let's go back to verse 5. He commands these, these simple matters of character and behavior so that the word of God will not be blasphemed, so that the word of God will not be spoken evil of or discredited. Our translation here says dishonored. But the word really speaks to what people say. It's not just dishonoring it in your heart, but it's saying dishonorable things about it out loud. You look at about seven different translations, and you'll see actually seven different words, because this this word can can be taken a lot of ways, but they all have to do with, with speaking evil of something or seeking to discredit it. So he's making a direct connection between our behavior, our actions, our attitudes, and how other people speak about God's word. That's the motivation that he gives us. How do other people speak about God's word? Now, what is God's word? God's word is the revelation of himself. It's how he tells us who he is and what he's like and what he has done and what he wants us to do. God's word is the the display of his character. So when you talk about God's word, you're talking about God. When you dishonor the revelation of God, you're dishonoring God. And Paul is saying that our behavior has a direct effect 
on how some people may speak about God's word and God's character. Similarly, look at verse 8. Do this so that the opponent will be put to shame having nothing bad to say about us. Now, we don't like to think about it that way. It's not, it's not us against the world in that sense. Like, like we're in a, a debate with people and we're trying to win the argument. They're our opponent. We're trying, to, we're trying to, to win them to Christ. They are our friends. And yet there are some people who are antagonistic, actively antagonistic towards us. Many of you have people like that in your life who would view you as an opponent. And they are certainly an opponent of God, an opponent of the truth and the gospel. And he says... You should behave in a certain way so that when they try to discredit you by attacking you personally, they don't have a leg to stand on, so that they are put to shame because they have nothing bad to say about us. People like to use a, an ad hominem attack and attack the person and say, what you're saying can't be true because look at what you do. So he says, let's not give them ammunition for that because there's something really big at stake here. What's at stake is that person's view of God, that person's view of the truth and of Christianity. And so what's at stake is their soul. And your behavior affects how they view you, and thus it affects how they view the truth about God, how they view the gospel. So let's not give them ammunition. Let's not give them opportunity to dismiss the gospel because of our life, because of our attitudes, because of our choices. You know, uh, Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3 makes the same connection between our conduct and opponents of the gospel. He says in 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. And keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better if God should will it that you suffer for doing what is right than for doing what is wrong. So if someone's going to slander you and accuse you, let it be a false accusation because they hate God and they're rejecting the gospel, not because it's something that's actually true about you. Don't give them opportunity to dismiss the gospel because they can dismiss you. Keep a good conscience so that when you're slandered, it's for doing right, not for doing wrong. Our our daily lives, our daily choices have everything to do with how the gospel goes forth, with how other people view God. And the beautiful illustration of that is in verse 10. When he says, he's, in, in verses 9 and 10, he's talking to slaves. We could think perhaps of being employees with bosses, with masters. Look at verse 9. Urge bond slaves to be subject to their own masters and everything to be well-pleasing, not argumentative. Okay, those are pretty simple things, right? Be agreeable. Don't be someone who's always talking back to your boss, someone who always has an answer, always has an argument. Be pleasing. Don't be argumentative. And then he says not, not pilfering. That means not, not taking to yourself, not hiding some on the side. Don't steal from your boss. Seems simple enough, but it is, it is uh, all too common not pilfering, but showing all good faith. And there I think he's talking really about faithfulness. He's contrasting it with stealing. Be reliable. Be someone who's faithful. I think the King James uses the word all good fidelity. That's a good translation. Be someone who's dependable and reliable and trustworthy so that they, the servants, will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. What does that mean? How do you adorn the doctrine of God? Well, to adorn means to make something beautiful. The, the word here is, is, the, is, the verb is cosmeo. It's where we get our word cosmetic, like how something looks, the attractiveness of something, or, or cosmetology. It, it means to, to arrange something in an orderly way. Think of the way you arrange flowers. You take flowers and they're beautiful and you arrange them in a certain way. I say you, some of you can do this, most of us can't. But you arrange flowers in a certain way to present their beauty in the most optimal way. You've arranged them, you've ordered them for maximum attractiveness. You haven't actually done anything to the flowers. You haven't changed them. They were beautiful when you got them. You're just arranging them in a certain way. That's adorning them. You are adorning the flowers by arranging them. You have all 
adorned yourselves this morning. Thank you for doing that, by the way. (laughs) You do not look the way you looked when you rolled out of bed. You have adorned yourself. You've put on clothes. And you've made some effort to make those clothes not visually distracting. Like we want them to coordinate enough that it's not an assault to the rest of us. So we can just look at you and engage with you and not be distracted by what you're wearing. You have adorned yourself in an orderly way. You have, some of you, have the opportunity to arrange your hairs and put them in different places. (laughs) Thank you for doing that. It makes the rest of us feel better. You have adorned yourself. You've made yourself attractive. You've made yourself... Uh, appealing by making yourself look orderly. So how do we do that to the doctrine of God? This doesn't mean to add beauty to it, okay? This isn't like, like um, I'm going to get in trouble. This isn't like makeup, okay? This is, this is cosmetic, but it's not quite cosmetology. This isn't adding beauty. You're not covering something up. You're not, you're not trying to enhance it. It's not that kind of adorning. It's not adding beauty to. It's doing something to show the beauty of it, like the flowers. It's it's to put the beauty that's already there on display. That's what we do with the doctrine of God. And I think a great illustration of this for me has been the idea of a painting and a frame. Okay, Think about a picture frame with me for a minute. What is the purpose of a frame around a painting? You probably have some decorations in your house, pictures, perhaps artwork with a frame. Or you go to a museum and you see great paintings, hundreds of years old, beautiful, beautiful paintings that are worth millions of dollars, and there's a frame that's, that's perhaps recently been put on it. The frame isn't as old as the painting. Someone else has come along and, and added the frame to the painting. Why? What does a frame do? Well, number one, it, it draws our eye to the painting. It it separates it from the rest of the wall. You've got a white wall and then a white canvas. You put that frame around it, and it sets it off. It highlights it. It draws your eye to it. It attracts you to it so that when you walk through the gallery or you walk through a house, your eye goes, oh, look at that. And you, you then go over and look at the painting, right? Not the frame. The, the purpose of a frame is to attract your attention to the painting while not attracting your attention to itself. I think that's a good illustration of how we relate to the doctrine of God. A frame attracts attention to something that is already beautiful, something that is already attractive to highlight it. And the frame should complement the painting, right? Because you want to attract and not detract from it. If you, if you put the wrong frame with the painting, it can be a distraction. And then you come over and all you, can, all you can see is the frame and you're not actually looking at the painting. So it should be something that's fitting and suitable. Last night, I was uh, pacing around our house. Because that's what I do in the final stages of sermon prep is I, I pace and I mumble to myself. You can ask my wife about this. She was, she was trying to be with me, the poor thing. And <laughs> she came into the kitchen where I had the, the laptop. And, but then I was up and down the hallway in the living room. She goes, should I, are you going to be? I'm, like, I'm going to be all over the house because that's where I am in the sermon prep. She's like, oh, right, okay. So, so I'm pacing around the house last night and I'm, I'm looking at things hanging on our walls. I'm looking at, at paintings and frames, thinking about frames. And we have different kinds of frames in our house. Uh, someone just recently gave us for Christmas a beautiful, uh, it's, it's the text of the old gospel song, The Old Rugged Cross. And behind it is like the sheet music from the hymnal for it and beautiful lettering. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. And just around the corner from there, we have another frame with a family picture. Heidi Jean and I holding Xander when he was like a few months old, and he looks like a different person, and it seems like that was a long time ago. But there's this, this picture of us, all right? Both of those pictures are in a frame, okay? One of those frames is dark brown, it's about that thick, and has some subtle gold leafing, gold filigree on the outside. And the other one is bright gold, and it has Winnie the Pooh and Piglet and a couple of butterflies and a bunch of flowers. Which one do you think is on which picture? What would you say if you came to my house and I had the text of the old rugged cross with Winnie the Pooh whimsically around it? Something's wrong with that, right? That frame does not complement that picture. And in fact, I would, be, I would be doing a disservice to that picture. 
because I would be not only distracting your attention, because Winnie the Pooh is much more interesting than calligraphy, but I would be saying that this text is something whimsical. This text is something fun. And so I, I, I didn't change the picture at all. I just changed the frame, but I'm saying something about the picture with the frame. The frame communicates something to you about who, how you ought to think about the text of the Old Rugged Cross as something fun and silly and, and whimsical. So the frame must be suitable for what it's framing. So if our lives, if our actions are going to be a frame for the truth about God, it must be fitting with what that truth is. I read a a little Wall Street Journal article about choosing a frame for your art, and they talked to uh, this guy named Eli Wilner. He's the CEO of a big New York art framing dealer. This quote jumped out at me. He said, I would prefer to view a work of art unframed than to put it in the wrong frame. The wrong frame will destroy the artist's intentions. Is that ever true of us? Would it be better if someone just encountered the doctrine of God without us involved? Have we distorted the artist's intentions by the way our lives frame the truth. And yet here we are, all of us, frames for God's truth. This is how God has chosen to display himself through people. And so right at that moment, you might say, I'm not a very good frame. I'm actually kind of a mess. My life certainly is not worthy of being a presentation frame for the truth of God. You might read through a passage like this with these, with these practical instructions about character and behavior, and you might think, I've got a long way to go in a lot of these areas. Well, in that moment, I think there are, there are at least two possible responses to your response. Number one, to say, yeah, that's true. And you need to change. We need to press on and continue to grow. We need the Spirit to change us, to make us into a better frame. Two weeks ago, Pastor Tim preached to us a call to change. In that sermon, he said, our personal spiritual change matters very much to God. In fact, it matters much more than perhaps impressive evangelistic exploits. It matters more than our big accomplishments for God Personal change, that is growth in our love for God and love for others. Personal change is the clear, dominant emphasis in the New Testament epistles. This is what God talks to us about. What you are like as a Christian is much more important than what you do as a Christian, he said. So yeah, we need to change. We need to grow because we are frames for the truth. Whether we like it or not, that's the position we're in. People look at God's truth through Us, we are what draw their attention to it. But that's good news. Because as we saw two weeks ago in Ephesians 2, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. God made you a new creature. And he created you for good works to glorify him, to draw attention to the truth about him. And you are his workmanship. See, he's the one who makes the frames. And he's working on you. And Philippians 1 says, He who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. God is not done working on us frames. He is making us what we ought to be so that we will draw attention to him. So that we will draw the eye of people to the truth about his character. So if we look at our life as a frame and we say, I'm, I need to change, the answer is yes, you do. But the second response is that, you know what? God knows you're a mess. God knows that you are dust. God knows that you are weak. And yet, this is his design. You see, God chose you to be a frame for the truth about him. He has not chosen the wise or the strong. He has chosen the the foolish and the weak things to shame the wise. God chose you to be his truth frame. That's his design, and it's a good design. It's a good plan. You know, God always communicates to us through people. 
God sends messengers. God sends people from Moses to the prophets, to the apostles, to you and me. When God communicates truth, he does it through people. And that's what the incarnation was all about. God came as a human being to communicate himself to us, to commune with us. That's what he does. And in the case of us and Moses and the prophets and the apostles, he chose weak, broken people to be the frames for his truth. That's part of the plan. But the plan is not to leave us as he finds us, but to make us into better frames. But he knows that we're weak. You know, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 that we have, we've been entrusted with the gospel ministry and we have this ministry in earthen vessels, in clay pots. God takes this treasure of the gospel and he puts it in a clay pot and that's how he transmits it. He takes the beautiful picture of all of his glory, of all of his character, and he puts it in a plain wooden frame or even a frame that's made out of mud. You know, your kids made a frame, they made a craft out of clay, and it's all lumpy and painted funny and lopsided and cute, and you love it, right? <laughs> Jesus, Jesus loves you, the lumpy, lopsided frame that you are. And he loves you so much that he's still working on you and he's changing you and he's making you better. But he chose you to be the frame for his truth. And what better frame for the truth about God's greatness than, than our weakness? How do, you, how do you frame truth about God's mercy? How about with people who really, really need it? We frame God's faithfulness with our weak, struggling faith. Because the idea isn't to draw attention to the frame. The idea isn't, look how great we are. We've got it all together. The idea is, look at him. I'm a mess, but I'm close to him because I need him. So look at him. We're drawing people's attention to the beauty of God. And so in his wisdom, he knows that our weakness will, will be part of that plan and only help it. It doesn't mean that our sin is part of the plan in that sense. It doesn't mean that, that I'll just be as sinful as I can be to magnify God's grace. No, 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 no. Paul answers that very clear and clearly in Romans 6. That's not how we are to think about our sin. We are to see our need to change and strive for it. But when we just see our weakness, our humanness, our dustiness, accept that that's part of God's beautiful plan, and it's how he enhances his beauty and his glory. God chose you to be a truth frame. Turn with me over to 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's look at another related illustration. First Peter chapter 2, verse 4. And coming to him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. You are being built up as a house, as a dwelling place for God. Are, are we worthy of being a dwelling place for God? Are we a fitting tabernacle for him in our own merit? No, but we are being built up into that. We are growing up into Christ-likeness, and that's what he has done. He has chosen us to be a house, to be a dwelling place, that so we can mix the metaphors, to be a house for the painting. He's chosen us as a frame for himself, and he's building us up to be what he wants us to be. And look down at verse 9, another familiar verse. You are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Why? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He's chosen you to be a frame so that you will be able to declare his excellencies, so that you will draw people's attention to his glory, to his greatness, because 
He called us out of darkness and he called us to his glory. So we frame that glory and we proclaim it to everyone around us. And we say, come and look at him. Come and see his beauty. So what does that mean practically today? That means that your small steps of growth, even in the, in the simplest areas of life, that growth serves the, the eternal cosmic purpose of God proclaiming his excellent character to all people. Creation sings the Father's song. Let all creation stand and sing. Fill the earth with songs of worship. How do we do that? By changing a little bit more to be like Jesus today. As you progress in your love for God, as you grow in your love for the people in your life, what that is is God doing restoration work on your frame. He is increasing your ability to serve as a frame that attracts people to consider the beauty of God. So thinking through some of the practical things in this passage now. Verse 2. Men, he talks about perseverance. When you persevere, when you remain steadfast, when you remain faithful, even in small ways, even in the simple day-to-day things, when you persevere in your faith and you say, I'm going to believe God today and I'm going to stay close to Jesus today and I'm going to trust him for today, that perseverance adorns the truth of God. That is a frame around the faithfulness of God. You are highlighting his perfect faithfulness by your small growth in faithfulness. Verse 3 Older women, I will let you decide which category you fall into. Older women, when you let the Spirit help you resist the temptation to gossip, when you could talk about that person behind their back and you don't, you are adorning the doctrine of God. You are being a frame around the truth of who God is. Your love for that person, your reverent behavior is an attractive frame for much bigger truths, big things about God that that people need to know in order to have a right relationship with him. Your simple choices, your simple actions are a frame for that truth. You adorn the doctrine of God. Not because the doctrine of God needs any enhancement. It just needs you to draw people to it, to behold the beauty Young women, when you grow in those small acts of love for your husband, you know, those simple things that sometimes you just don't feel like doing, and then the Spirit helps you to do that lovingly and sacrificially, or your children, when you're loving towards your children, your life is saying something about God to a watching world and to your family. See, the frame isn't just for unsaved people. Everyone in your life sees something about God through the frame of your life. Check this out, ladies. Verse 5 connects housework with how other people talk about God's word. When you work at home, all the little and big things that you sacrificially do to keep your house operating, that just might be used by God as a defense for the truth of Scripture. That's what he says. He says, do your work at home so that the word of God will not be evil spoken of. When you do laundry, you are defending the eternal truth of God. That's what he says. Every aspect of your life can be an important frame for the truth. Young men, when you act sensibly, You know what that means? That means being of sound mind and self-control so that you don't do stupid things. When you act sensibly or when you make a point of intentionally seeking to do good deeds for other people. I'm going to use my life to help other people and do something good for them. Or when you 
Refuse to let those questionable things come out of your mouth. Things that you could say, and then you don't because the Spirit convicts you. That is spiritual growth, and God wants to use that to silence those who would discredit the truth. Simple acts of obedience. Simple growth in Christ-likeness. God wants to use that for the defense of his truth, for others to see the beauty of God and to be, to be drawn to him and to become disciples and be saved. Your behavior matters because of eternity, because of people's souls. And God wants to use you to do this. God has chosen you to be his truth frame. That's a, that's a very privileged position. You know, you think about the, the most beautiful and most valuable painting in the art gallery. You think they choose the frame for that casually and quickly? God chose a frame for the eternal truth about himself, for his character, and he chose us. And so that is a role that is privileged, but that is a role that requires every one of us to be growing and changing. That makes us really dependent on him to change us today. So, so take heart. You are his workmanship. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works. You were created to declare the excellencies of his greatness. And he who began a good work in you will keep doing it. He's still making your frame. He will keep doing it until the day of Christ Jesus. God is not only the perfect painting, but he's the master frame maker. He designed us to be frames. We got broken by our sin, and he restores us. There's great hope because God is the restorer of the frame. So let's ask, in what areas is God wanting you to change so that you can be the kind of frame that points people to him? And then ask him to help you change. Let's pray for change. And then let's praise him when that change comes. Because the result is not that people come and say, look at that great frame, looking good frame. No, they come and they see the beauty of God, the power of God unto salvation, beholding the beauty of Christ that then changes them to be like him. What, what greater way to spend our lives than growing as a better frame so that we can point people to this matchless, beautiful painting that is the truth about God.